my central theme is that those who think that the Brexit debate is over in Britain, that we've left, it's settled, we can now focus on other things and forget all about Brexit, are mistaken. That analysis is wrong for uh, at least half a dozen reasons, slightly more. The first reason is, of course, that the deal that Boris Johnson signed is incomplete. It was only a partial deal, far from being oven ready. Indeed, I think for some sectors, it's more like funeral ready. Um, it didn't settle a number of issues like access for services to the European economy, like how we would participate, which apparently we still want to do, in European research and development programmes and what our financial contribution would be. That is still to be settled. How we would participate in the emissions trading scheme, which apparently we want to do, which is a key part of how Europe as a continent implements the Paris climate change agreements. None of that was settled. It was left to... Uh, be settled afterwards and it's still these issues have still not been settled nor really has the question of the governance of the agreements because under the trade and cooperation agreements there is supposed to be a joint council of ministers partnership council um, and a joint parliamentary assembly these have still to be set up and they're quite important because the Partnership Council ha has the extraordinary power of being able to supplement or amend the Trade and Cooperation Agreement without parliamentary approval on either side, in principle, in, in, since then the European Parliament has uh, managed to get uh, assurances that it at least will be consulted in advance of any such changes, but Westminster hasn't. Westminster hasn't even asked for it. But, um, we all know why that's the case. So that's the first reason why Brexit is not settled as an issue at all in Britain, why it will continue to come back, cause controversy and cause division and uh, remain an active issue in British politics, whether you like it or not. It's, that's the first reason it's an incomplete deal. The second reason is that where it does settle things, it settles them badly. It, of course, is a hard Brexit in economic terms. It takes us not only out of the EU, but out of the single market and out of the customs union. It would have been possible to have a softer form of Brexit that uh, would have attenuated some of the economic consequences and indeed political consequences when you think of Northern Ireland that this hard Brexit entails. But the government chose not to do that. It chose the it chose um, the hardest form of Brexit that it could, more or less. Um, that means that even though we have agreed a trade deal with zero tariffs on goods, nonetheless, by being outside of the customs union, it would be the same for any customs union, selling goods into a customs union, exporting into it, requires, under WTO rules, checks on the rules of origin of the goods in question. To check that, in this case, British goods that we're selling into the European Union market really are British goods and not Korean goods or whatever that have come via Britain to avoid European tariffs. That is an onerous set of checks upstream for firms with lots of form filling and red tape and quite often verification checks at the border causing delays. This is a huge, a significant burden for small firms in particular and the delays are a significant risk for any product that is fresh, agricultural products, fishing, etc. It also is a handicap the other way around, by the way. We've still not set up our full border checks, but when we do, that is, is not exactly good for Britain's supply chains. And so 
we are having what I think Andrew Adonis has called, who's the president, the chairman of the European movement, has called a trade reduction deal. That's what it is with our main trading partners, our neighboring countries. We have for the first time in living memory in our his history really embarked on a trade deal that actually reduces trade, therefore reduces prosperity and will destroy jobs and will cost the exchequer a lot of money as well. But it's not just on the economic side that it's a bad deal. It takes us out of the security and police cooperation structures like Europol, like the European arrest warrant, like the shared police databases, where previously any our border forces, to take that one example, when somebody came into the country and they had their passport checked, you had real time access to police databases, shared databases that should tell you immediately whether that person was a wanted person, had a criminal record, um, was a fugitive from justice. We no longer have that. That's gone. Um, there are now much more roundabout procedures, but they are not nearly so good. And then there's the gratuitous vandalism of leaving the Erasmus Student Exchange Scheme, a very popular EU policy. And the reason they've left it is, is very clear. They do not want young people from Britain experiencing the close connections, the cultural connections that this scheme created, the friendships across borders, the uh, network of, of uh, academics and students and others across Europe that the Erasmus Student Exchange Scheme created. There's no other reason for us to have opted out of that. There are plenty of third countries that plug into that and we could have done, it was offered to us and it was rejected by this government. So that's the second set of reasons. First set is it's a deal with gaps, doesn't settle things. Second reason where it does settle things, it settles them badly. The third reason is that it has inbuilt conflict in it. The access of British goods to the single European market is tariff free and unrestricted in quantities on condition that the UK continues to observe the same or similar standards to the European Union when it comes to consumer protection, environmental standards, workplace rights, health and safety of products. It could hardly be otherwise. The EU was not going to allow British firms to compete in its market on the basis of lower standards, undercutting those standards, competing as they would see it unfairly or triggering a race to the bottom in standards. So of course that was the condition. But we know that this government wants to diverge from EU standards. It wants to lower them, certainly in terms of agriculture, for instance, in order to secure a trade deal with the USA. But also we've seen the discussion about uh, uh, that touches on workplace rights, working, workers' rights. They want to loosen the working time directive, for instance. They've been talking about that and then said, oh, no, 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 we'll see that later. Well, in due course, there is going to be divergence. When those diverging standards arise, the EU has the right to take countervailing measures, restricting the access of those British goods to the European market, either by placing a tariff or banning them entirely or whatever. So there will be conflicts as and when Britain, which under this government is in due course almost certain, diverges from European standards. The fourth reason is actually, well, it's, it's linked to that in a way, but it's more immediate. This government seems to want conflict with the European Union, to keep the fires burning of cultural conflict, of, of rousing the, a nationalist narrative, these bloody bureaucrats in, these, in Brussels, these awful foreigners, look what they're doing to us. It seems to want to keep a series of conflicts going. Now, this can be important things like unilaterally disapplying parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol or unilaterally changing the uh, requirements for allowing fishing in British waters 
or other things of that nature, down to little petty little things, like when the government refused, it's just back down on this after while it, while it thought nobody was looking over the last week, it, when the government refused to give the uh, head of the EU's representation in London ambassador status. The EU has ambassadors to 145 countries across the world. Only in the UK under this government was that status of having ambassadorial status queried and refused for months by the UK government. They've now backed down on that one, but it shows how they are determined to engineer petty conflicts with the EU for their own uh, electoral or ideological purposes. Um, fifth reason, um, Scotland, obviously, one of the arguments in the case that the SNP will be making for Scottish independence is, is Brexit. And from their point of view, not surprisingly, the referendum on Scottish independence uh, six or seven years ago, um, one of the arguments used against independence was to say, oh, careful, if you leave the UK, you'll be leaving the European Union, that will cause all sorts of problems, etc. And so some people who might have voted for independence would have said, no, no, we can't risk that only to be then dragged out of the EU by the rest of the UK. Of course, the Scottish National Party is going to use that as an argument. And of course, if the government sticks to the hardest form of Brexit, no compromise whatsoever, that will play into the hands of the SNP in terms of the debate on Scottish independence. Similar effects, potentially, we're seeing it now, actually, not potential, is the consequences for Northern Ireland. By leaving the EU, and especially on top of that, leaving the customs union and the single market, that created a, a customs border and a regulatory border between Britain and the EU. Where were those checks going to be? They could not be, everybody agreed that at the outset, on the land border between Northern Ireland and Ireland which goes zigzags in between villages, it's totally impractical and it would have huge political ramifications to do so. So what's, what do you do about that? They explored all kinds of technological solutions. They, they're not ready, won't be for years if ever. Theresa May initially said, right, the whole of the UK will stay in a customs union with the EU to avoid that becoming a customs border until we find a solution one day with no deadline set. Boris Johnson and the ERG, the right wing of the Conservative Party, said, no, that's outrageous, that's a sellout, that's Brexit in name only, we can't accept that, um, defeated her deal, and then came up with the border down the Irish Sea, which is indeed the only remaining option. Um, it's, I should say, a boundary. It's not really a border, it's a boundary for customs checks and regulatory checks, some of which took place anyway in the past for, for animal transport, for instance, between Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom. But having said that one point that that was totally unacceptable for any British Prime Minister, that's precisely what Boris Johnson negotiated. That is now causing disquiet, to put it mildly, in Northern Ireland. That being said, the protocol regarding Northern Ireland was to attenuate the problems caused by Brexit. Without it, these problems would be worse. But having sold it to the Ulster Unionists in particular in a totally dishonest way, Johnson is now reaping the consequences of that. But sadly, so is everybody else, not just, uh, well, especially those people in Northern Ireland. It's the, where that will lead to remains to be seen, but it's another reason why Brexit is not a dead issue, is continuing to cause issues in UK politics, will continue to do so, cannot be ignored, has to be considered. The, I've lost count now, sixth reason I think, is that there are 
and will be unavoidably cross-border issues where we and the European Union have to find common solutions to common problems, whether we like it or not. These range from uh, climate change to um, refugee and migration problems, where just trying to dump your problem on your neighbour is just not workable, makes the whole situation worse. You have to find common solutions to issues like that. Um, to uh, the future of uh, fishing quotas, because the fishing agreement only lasts five, five years, um, so we're not that far away of, of starting negotiations on what comes next. And fish have this unfortunate habit of swimming from one country's waters to another. You cannot solve the problem of overfishing and therefore limiting your take from fishing unilaterally. Whether you like it or not, you have to negotiate with your neighbours. And indeed, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea requires you to do so. So leaving the European Union doesn't give you any advantage whatsoever in that respect. On the contrary, it puts you at a disadvantage because you are now negotiating not as one of several equals around the table, but as one against the rest of them who have now have a common position. So there will again and again be controversial issues coming back for years to come. And the final reason why Brexit is not done, dusted and settled, is that there are plenty of people who will not let it rest. People like us on this call, people in the European movement, who are not happy, who don't think it was the right solution for Britain, that think that Britain, that, that sorry, that Brexit was a historic mistake. We're not going to shut up. We will continue to say that. But we won't be alone. It's actually leave voters who are the most entitled to say hang on a minute this is not what was promised this is not what i voted for we're seeing some of them those those fishermen we saw on television ago saying i voted for brexit i didn't think it would lead to this i regret it and there are others remember we were told it was going to be easy we had all the cards easiest deal in history it would save lots of money that would all go to the NHS. No problems. Shiny new trade deals with other countries across the world to replace the lost trade with the European Union. Every single aspect of that is turning out to be a lie. And what we as pro-Europeans should do is amplify the voice of people who voted for Brexit and now regret it. Because that, I think, is going, will have a major impact on public opinion. What we should do as a European movement, I think, is to amplify the voice of the latter and of all those victims of Brexit, as I would call it, the people whose jobs have been lost or are threatened, the people whose income has been reduced because of Brexit, the people who've lost opportunities from students to others because of Brexit, amplify their voices and, and, um, and keep plugging away at that because as, as, um, as Chris said earlier in the introduction, several opinion polls have shown that the majority of the public considers Brexit to have been a mistake. That is, that's not the same thing as saying that they would vote to reverse Brexit and want to campaign to rejoin the European Union. That takes another step. But if we get to a position where it becomes the received wisdom of the overwhelming majority of the British public that Brexit was a mistake, then that opens opportunities. It makes it easier to, at the very least, attenuate the damage by rectifying the worst parts of the withdrawal agreement, the worst elements, rejoining Erasmus, having a closer economic relationship, and, and so on and so forth. At least it would enable that. And who knows if public opinion really shifts strongly against Brexit, it might be possible to argue strongly in the near, in the medium term to rejoin the European Union. And we need to keep that hope alive because in the debate about what's happening now, there, there are voices out there interest groups, industries, farmers groups saying, we, we need a better deal. We need to do something better than this. 
And there are different ideas about how that could be done. But we need in that debate also to have some outriders, outriders who will say, let's go the whole way. We've made a mistake. We were misled by the advocates of Brexit. We need to bite the bullet and rectify that mistake. Now, I'm sure that won't become the overwhelmingly dominant view immediately, but unless somebody is saying that and putting it out there in the range of views, then we would never get to that position. And I think the European movement has to play that role of being a bit of an, of an advocate to rejoin. In a measured way, we're not saying let's rejoin by the end of this year. We can also say step by step. There's a lot of things that can be done even if we even if you don't want to rejoin, you want a better relationship, a less damaging one. Let's go for that. Let's build things brick by brick. But we also say that the best solution is not to attenuate the damage of Brexit, but to eliminate the damage of Brexit by rejoining the European Union. That's, that's what I think we should do as European movement. And indeed, if, if, we, if we don't do it, it's a gift to our opponents because they will say, ah, you see, it's a settled issue. Even the European movement doesn't think it's a good idea to rejoin the European Union. Even those most enthusiastic Europeans have accepted that Brexit was the right thing to do. We can't afford that in the debate in Britain. Thank you very much.